Welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody. What is our topic here today? It's Alzheimer's, how to plan for this, the latest resource, sorry, the latest research, what the research says, what we can do to deal with this, the resources available, and the legal steps that we all need to be aware of. And we're here with Claire Day, a leader in the Alzheimer's Association here in Northern California. We're really excited to have her here as a special guest today, and we're going to cover a lot. Uh, and before we get into uh, the content, I just want to make this point that the majority of American families face this issue. Or Claire's going to go into some of the details and some of the scary statistics about this, but it's something we all have to be aware of and something that we all have to deal with. We're going to give you actionable tools and resources that you can use as soon as you're done with this meeting. We're going to give you steps you can take to protect your family and protect everything you've worked for. And this is personal to us. I'm going to talk about my grandmother, Sylvia Gilfix, and what she went through and what that experience was like for our family. And we're going to give you a lot of new and powerful information, or maybe just some reminders of some of the steps you know you need to take, but we are passionate about spreading the word about this. So what are we going to cover here today? We're going to talk about our firm, Gilfix in the Poll, our history with the Alzheimer's Association, but also our personal history with Alzheimer's. Um, and then um, Claire is going to lead us through a section where she's going to go through the different types of Alzheimer's and dementia diagnoses, how you can get diagnosed, the importance of early diagnosis, what you can do to prevent it, and really importantly, some resources available if you face this uh, from the Alzheimer's Association and other organizations. And, and, and again, I love what she's going to talk about, about how you can deal with this and prevent it if we can, or at least slow it down. Some lifestyle changes you can make. Um, and then we're, of course, going to talk about the legal planning side of this. We're going to hit on the critical documents you need, the steps you need to take, what you need to address in these documents, mm -hmm. and the financial planning side, how they all link together, and some steps you can take right away. Um, and then we're going to take some questions at the end. And we always have to remind you, this is for educational purposes only. It's not legal or financial advice. It's meant to inform you. We hope you get a lot out of this. And of course, if you want to work with us, it's easy to find us at, at guildfix.com. But we want this to be educational, empowering, and spread the word if you find this to be useful. If there's anybody in your life who could benefit from this, this if you're not already watching our YouTube channel, it will be on our YouTube channel and it will be available to be shared. So before we get into the legal content here, I want to tell the story of Sylvia Gilfix. And Sylvia is my grand, was my grandmother. Um, she came from the former Soviet Union through Canada and then settled, we're not really sure why they chose this, in a small town in northern Michigan called East Taos. And that's where my dad was born and raised, along with my uncle Gil. And Sylvia was a beautiful, intelligent, wonderful, vivacious woman. This is her um, in her younger years, um, you can see where where my sisters get their good looks. Um, and she was just amazing. And, and I got to know her as obviously a little kid. She was the most incredible doting grandmother anybody could have. Um, on the right, you see my mom and, and grandma Sylvia and my sister Sean on the left. That's me in the plaid shirt and the goofy grin. Um, and grandma Sylvia is the super tanned one in the top right. And she was always very tanned, always very active and physical. And I remember growing up every year, uh, sorry, every Sunday, it was a wonderful tradition. I recommend this for anybody, by the way. If you want to catch your kid, your kids with your grand, their grandparents, make it a treat every time. Maybe you guys do this. But my parents, thank you, Dad, um, and my mom, Myra Gerson Gilfix, made it so easy to see her. They they made it so it was a joy to see her. We'd go to her house. She lived in Cupertino, and we would watch. Um, Fraggle Rock. She had HBO. We didn't have cable TV. I wasn't allowed to have cable TV. We'd watch Fraggle Rock on TV when we were there. We'd get to eat SpaghettiOs and other sweets and junk food. And it was always such a joy to, to spend time with her. It was a treat. But I remember over the years as I got older, she started to slip a little bit. Um, her memory started to go. She was working at a local um, drugstore and she was having issues there. She really wasn't safe driving anymore. And I was just a kid. I didn't really know everything that was going on. But over time, she got worse and she couldn't live by herself anymore. And my parents helped her to move into uh, more of a supportive community where she still lived on her own. And I remember that because instead of ordering, having Chef Boyardee SpaghettiOs, we shifted to Little Caesars Pizza. That's what we would always get when we went there. And I always looked forward to it. We'd watch TV with her. We'd hang out. But over the years and uh, months and years, her memory continued to slip um, and to the point where she started to forget more and more. And, and I don't remember all of the steps involved, but I do know that eventually she had to go to a nursing home. 
and she ended up in the the Jewish home in San Francisco, and that was rough. Um, and I remember when she first moved there, all of a sudden, those visits that used to be so joyful and so full of treats and wonders were no longer so much fun. We were in these dank halls. I mean, it's a great place, but, you know, it was a nursing home with a lot of issues. You had a lot of people with mental illness issues. There was chain smokers ever. So, so instead of smelling like candy and Chef Boyardee, it smelled kind of more like urine and cigarettes. Not, not exactly the best transition. And it just got harder and harder from there. At first, she still recognized us, um, but it got tougher and tougher. And I'm just going to share the photo of her again, because it's nice to remember when she was younger. And I remember towards the end, she no longer remembered us. She didn't know us. And the very end, she was actually hostile to us. She was, she, she didn't recognize us and she didn't even want to see us. And, and that was really hard. So I think many of you can relate. You've had a loved one who faced Alzheimer's or dementia. It feels like you lose them before you actually lose them. Um, and our family was well prepared for this, right? My, my parents are the, the godfather and the godmother of the field of elder law. And it was a huge challenge for them, even though my dad, as he'll talk about, has a long history with the Alzheimer's Association, my mom as well. It was still a huge challenge for them to navigate this. So we can only imagine what it's like for most American families who don't have that experience. So that's what this is about. If you face this, if you have a grandma Sylvia in your life, you need to understand these issues. And, and we were fortunate that we understood the issues. It was still so, so hard. So that's what we want you to get out of this. And our history with the Alzheimer's Association preceded even this. Um, so Mike, why don't you talk about that history and why this matters? In addition to my grandmother, what our connection to the Alzheimer's Association is? Sure. Our, our involvement uh, started in 1973. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Uh, that's the year I graduated from the Stanford Law School. And rather than do what all my fellow graduates did, which was join big law firms, I created the first free legal services program for older individuals in the entire nation. So Senior Adults Legal Assistance, SALA, still exists today in Santa Clara County. So in the 70s, I started immersing myself in these kinds of issues. And how do you deal with them? And what are the government benefit programs that could be relevant, that could be helpful? Just a myriad issues that nobody before that had ever explored. So, so there we were, getting involved, learning about dementia, a term I didn't even know about until I started, again, immersing myself in the field. Um, in the 80s, we started working very hard to create, help create and develop the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Association, the ADRDA, which is still the actual legal formal name of the Alzheimer's Association. So this goes back to the 80s. Uh, uh, a physician, local physician, Gary Steinke, some of you might know, he and I and a woman whose husband had the disease, we were on television, we were on the radio, we were doing all we could to build awareness and start to develop the legal tools with which we are now so fluent. And now we, we teach other attorneys about how to do this. So, you know, the really important point here is that we didn't come to this field because, oh boy, it's a business opportunity. We, um, we started the field. We did it because of devotion and interest. And that was before my mother had the disease. That was, I wouldn't call it fortuity, but as Mark said, we were more equipped we were familiar with the options. We weren't devastated to see the per progress because we were familiar with it. That didn't make it easier. There's no question about that, but we were equipped. And uh, I, I always like to do a little show and tell. The first book uh, about Alzheimer's disease was this book. Uh, 35 years ago, Understanding Alzheimer's Disease, and the uh, author and editor uh, asked me to write, I wrote the chapter on legal planning. So again, our history with Alzheimer's Association and the, and the issue, is it's as deep and as rich as it could possibly be. We continue to focus on this, as Clara well knows, it's something we feel very deeply about. Um, and uniquely, as we get into these programs, we understand how to integrate this issue with all other aspects of planning. And it takes 20 years of experience to know how to do that. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a privilege to, be, to continue to work with the Alzheimer's Association and to have Claire with us. So with that, you know, let, me, uh, let me actually introduce Claire. And then she can talk, she can educate all of us uh, about some history and so forth. So um, Claire, Claire has been with the Alzheimer's Association like 22 years. I, and I just think that's tremendous. You need institutional knowledge to have a real sense of where things are. Uh, and, and as you'll see, Claire really has that. Uh, she oversees uh, the clinical and support operations for the Northern California and Northern Nevada Association. They merged many years ago. 
by training. Uh, she's a clinical social worker. Uh, she's been working in this field for her entire career. I guess, you know, Claire and I have that very much in common. And now Mark, too, is immersing himself really from day one. So, Claire, if you would, uh, let's talk about the association and the services you provide. Yeah, thank you, Mike and Mark, and thank you for inviting us to be here. We uh, love this partnership. It's, as you said, so rich in, rich in history. And really what we want to do tonight is show you, give you a little bit of education um, and really help to solidify um, some of the information that you may or may not know and, and what you do need to know uh, as you move forward uh, if you are on certainly on this journey. So I'm just going to share my slides here. Um, hopefully, okay, All right. <laughs> you can see them? Yes. Oh, awesome, okay. So, um, and uh, you know, as, as uh, Mike talked about, this is, we're, this is our work, this is what we've done. We're certainly um, in this to provide care and support to all affected, thinking about things like risk reduction. Mark talked about the importance about us learning uh, about risk reduction and what we can all do today to decrease our risks of developing dementia um, and until we find that way, uh, till we have a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. Um, just last Wednesday, the Alzheimer's Association released our annual facts and figures uh, report um, with some sort of staggering changes and um, a little bit of the state of the union on what uh, the cost of care is, the impact on prevalence across the country. Um, just a few of our statistics here, uh, that, that one right there, over 11 million Americans provide what we call unpaid care, that's family caregivers. Um, if we were to equate that to hours, it would be the equation of 18 billion hours valued at nearly $340 billion. Uh, but I'm just going to click here and uh, play our, our facts and figures video, which will really give you uh, the landscape of, of the entire report in a little snapshot. So here we go. <music> So what I thought was really interesting about one of those statistics too, um, and why we talk about the importance of early detection and diagnosis and understanding dementia, understanding Alzheimer's disease, um, you might have seen one of the statistics says four in 10 people report their early warning signs to their physician, yet seven out of 10 people would want to know that something was was wrong. And I think that's um, such an important thing is that we want to know, but we don't wanna know, right? There's so much unknown about Alzheimer's disease and dementia still. Um, and what we hope that programs like tonight can do is really help to destigmatize Alzheimer's and dementia, really help to bring awareness and help you find support if that's what you're looking for. So a little bit of level setting, dementia is really considered to be that umbrella term, right? Dementia is a collection of symptoms related to that cognitive decline. So if you think of that umbrella and change the word dementia to flowers, underneath it, you'd have all the different types of flowers like daisies and petunias and tulips and roses. Um, 
Dementia is the same. It's sort of that umbrella term. It, it describes the symptoms. What's underneath that umbrella is those different types of dementia, those different types of biological changes in the brain that are causing cognitive, behavioral, and psychological symptoms. Um, what's really important to know is that uh, this type of dementia, as we're talking about it tonight, is not a normal part of aging. As we age, um, we all get a little forgetful. We've all walked into a room and forgotten why we've walked in there. There's a difference between that and, and this sort of change in your brain that really impacts your ability to perform your activities of daily living in an independent way. Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia, and unfortunately, people can have more than one type of dementia. And uh, while some of these causes can be uh, considered to be reversible, that's usually related to uh, drug or alcohol use or some sort of medical change that can be uh, impacted with a medical uh, treatment. What we're talking about here with Alzheimer's, with vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and others are not reversible, which means that over time they will get worse. Um, the symptoms can't improve. We're learning a lot about those differences and how they present differently in the brain. Just to give you an idea of what, what should I be looking for? What are those differences between normal aging and Alzheimer's disease? You know, my, my knees don't work as good as they used to, so my brain's the same way. I think what's important to take away with this slide is the word change. What's different from six months or 12, 12 months ago? So when we talk about memory changes that are disrupting life, we're really talking about um, new changes or um, something that's, uh, you know, that short sort of short term memory. Our, our memory is we, we have different types of memory. That long term memory, Mark's ability to kind of I, I, I can vision, Mark, that you're um, you're sort of smelling and tasting those SpaghettiOs and the yeah. theme song from Fraggle Rock when you're telling that story. Um, that's a long term memory, right? Those are institutional in our brain. The, the color of the curtains from our first home or our bedroom carpet all of those things, those are long-term memories. It's our short-term memory. Um, what we had for breakfast this morning, did we take the medication? Did you remember to unplug the, the uh, you know, the curling iron or the hair dryer? That's short-term memory. Um, and that is the memory that disrupts daily life. And that's the memory that's typically impacted early with um, Alzheimer's disease. Challenges in planning and solving problems. So sort of that challenge in, in just sort of being able to manage your day-to-day difficulty performing some of your familiar tasks, like going to the grocery store, writing a list and, and knowing that that's on the list and you got to get it at the store. And um, I, re I remember uh, a, a son telling us a story that he always would do his weekly shopping for his mom. And one week she had a couple of items on the list. And when he went to put them away in her cupboard, her cupboard was full of that item. And, and she didn't recognize, she couldn't sort of make the list and, and make that make that um, connection. Confusion with time and place. So sort of getting uh, the, the loss of sense of time, which I think uh, is a really interesting one. Um, I think over the last few years, we've all sometimes had that feeling that yeah. time stands still or is going too fast. Uh, but this is this would be forgetting doctor's appointments, showing up on the wrong day. You think you think the doctor's appointment is on this day. And even if you're looking at a calendar, you're you're still showing up at the wrong time, missing appointments altogether. Trouble understanding images and spatial relationships. That's a depth perception. Um, thinking of uh, where you might see a step or uh, even a pattern in the floor. New problems with words in, uh, in speaking or writing, misplacing things, losing that ability to retrace your steps. Those are the things we do when we can't remember something. If you have ever walked into a room, you ever backed out and think, oh, if I walk back in again, it'll trigger. Um, not being able to do that it would be a concern. Decreased or poor judgment. I know Mark had talked about um, uh, driving, and we certainly look at driving as an issue. You know, uh, if you're not, not recognizing the difference between a red light, a yellow light, and a green light, that can be a concern. And then, of course, we look at withdrawal from social activities and changes in mood and behavior. Again, all new changes. You also want to always 
always think about how we go about getting diagnosed and making sure that if there are some problems that would be causing um, withdrawal, like um, depression or anxiety, that you get those treated as well. So these are the things to look for when you think, hmm, is it more than just normal aging? Um, and these are the things that would sort of, I would say, prompt you to want to at least ask your healthcare professional um, that you're experiencing some of these and give some examples. Now, we know a lot about what's happening in the brain, um, and we know a lot about who's at risk, um, and we don't know some of those whys. Um, so what impacts our risk, we know that we have what we call non-modifiable risk factors. Those are those things like age, genetics, our, our race and ethnicity, sex and gender. We can't control those. But research is really looking at a lot of these things on the right side as well as what may impact our risk, put us at an increased risk. Um, we know that genes play a smaller role um, then perhaps age, uh, one in eight people over the age of 65, one in three people over the age of 85 will develop Alzheimer's disease. You saw that statistic in the video, the lifetime risk for women over the age of 45, one in five, it's only one in 10 over for men. A um, lot of research looking at that. We've always thought it's because women live longer. But it turns out that there may be more to that. And so looking at some of those, uh, the hormonal changes in women, some of those biological differences in women that could be putting us at an increased risk. And so all of these things on this right side are being studied across all angles um, because we think and believe that a future will involve not just uh, a, hopefully a, a medication or treatment that could stop or slow the progression, but a combination of also these risk reduction um, strategies as well. Now, one of the things that Mark and Mike are going to talk about is the importance of planning. And we know that early detection and diagnosis is a big part of that. An early diagnosis can have an emotional, social, and medical benefit on, on for you. Not only does it help you to think about making those legal and financial decisions and uh, learning a, a lot about making sure that you have all of those right things in place to protect yourself, but it allows you to also think about uh, understanding what your symptoms will look like, understanding what treatment options may be available for you. And we've seen that people have had some improved outcomes when they're able to plan properly um, and really actually be diagnosed with Alzheimer's instead of something else. Uh, the One of the challenges that we have with Alzheimer's is right now, the diagnostic process is tricky. It's it's a, a matter of ruling out other things. And while um, the next slide really talks about this importance of science catching up to help accelerate the speed of not just research, but hopefully clinical practice through things like biomarkers. So PET scans, if you've ever been familiar with a PET scan, they're not available in your general practitioner's office today. There's no one single test. So in order to diagnose someone, they do a history and physical, they will do maybe a, an MRI or a CAT scan, they'll do a blood test. But what they're looking for is other things that could be causing some of those warning signs, some of those changes in your memory or changes in your uh, mood or behavior. Once they are see, you know, see that there's nothing else that could be causing that cognitive loss and they'll do some memory tests um, and, and look at some other things. They give a, a diagnosis based on essentially ruling out anything else. Well, biomarkers or biological markers are changing the game for not just how we will conduct research because that's happening today. So that means that they're using some of these skilled tests in a research clinical trial to ensure that the right people are getting the medications that are being tested. But we're probably a little closer than we've ever been before to some more simple tests in your doctor's office. So while these are not available today, the research is showing us that probably in the next three to five years, we could even have a simple blood test that would show whether or not you have the biological marker for Alzheimer's disease. Right now, that's... Um, uh, something that's only being used in research, but is exciting to see that it will not only help us to identify easily non-invasive because PET scans 
again, not covered by insurance, so they're not readily available for people. Um, and some of the other things that are a little bit uh, more invasive, like cerebral spinal fluid taps, that's a pretty invasive test, but a blood test, I mean, we have blood tests to check our blood sugar and our cholesterol, something that could be very accessible to everybody, ensuring that people could get an accurate diagnosis. And essentially what that can help us to do is what we call modernizing the diagnosis, where we're moving from this area of history and cognition to where we actually can see uh, potentially the biomarkers of someone maybe even before they become symptomatic with cognitive changes. And that's really an important thing to think of as we start to think about effective treatments down the road. Now, we're not quite there yet. I know it sounds uh, exciting and promising. We're not quite there yet, but we are making progress towards risk reduction and more effective treatments. So recently uh, in 2021 and 2023, we had for the first time, um, a medication approved by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, the first one since um, the early 2000s. This one here in 2014 uh, was really a combination of these other medications. These medications in the gray box that date back to the uh, mid-90s, those are uh, medications that really just treat the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. They are actually not designed to slow down, modify, stop, reverse, uh, or reverse the disease. Rather, they're really just ensuring that there's maybe some relief from some of the symptoms. Well, the game changed in 2021 when for the first time we had a target that uh, looked at amyloid, one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, that buildup of beta amyloid in the brain. Um, and that was called aducanumab or Adjuhome is the, um, is the uh, brand name. Um, and while that had a, a little bit of mixed reviews just earlier this year in 2023, the FDA approved its second uh, amyloid targeted medication called Lakembi or Lakanamat. And what this drug is actually showing to do is slowing down disease progression by targeting that underlying biology. So again, over here, we're not slowing down progression. Here, we really are. And so this is sort of a new era of, of Alzheimer's treatments. Now, this is only for Alzheimer's disease because, of course, it's targeting that biology that makes Alzheimer's different from other types of dementia. But there is also more than 700 clinical trials going on in Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, uh, frontotemporal dementia, all focused on helping us get to that endpoint of understanding how how we can actually maybe stop um, the progression before it impacts people's cognitive abilities. But like I said, we're not quite there yet. It certainly is an exciting time in Alzheimer's uh, and dementia research. But until that time, there's this opportunity to really focus on risk reduction. And we know that up to 40% of dementia cases could be prevented or delayed by targeting all the fun stuff, right? Like eating right, exercising, um, maintaining some cognitive and social stimulation. It's all the fun stuff. So now I'm really going to burst your bubbles with a couple of data points that are going to make you really question um, some of your healthy lifestyle choices. So the first one uh, came out of the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, uh, the largest scientific conference in the, in the world. This was just from last July. And what this um, really showed us was the evidence to say all those ultra processed foods, like Mark, I hate to tell you, SpaghettiOs is probably on that <laughs> list, um, ha could have uh, an impact on your risk of developing um, dementia. So consuming more than 20% of your daily caloric intake. So it's not just one time when you go to visit Grandma Sylvia, it's, it's of your regular diet, where this would be part of your regular diet led to a 28% faster decline in global cognitive scores. So what's an ultra processed food? High in calories or sugar, um, high in, uh, really low in protein and fiber, right? So that's how you get to that ultra processed um, perspective, right? Where, so it's, it's a lot of those canned goods, those packaged goods that don't really have a lot of um, nutrient 
foods uh, that are, you know, part of a, a good holistic diet. So it's never too late, right, to incorporate one or two of these healthy actions today that could pre prevent um, cognitive decline as you age. The next study was really interesting. This also came out of AAIC last year, and this was a study that compared physical activity to strength and uh, balance training. So really we've what we've learned over the last several years about exercise um, is about cardiovascular exercise, right? That looking at that rate of exertion, that, that aerobic exercise, the more we could do to kind of get that heart rate up and really break a sweat, that seems to have the best benefit for our brain. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. Well, this study really wanted to test that a little bit more specifically in people who had mild cognitive impairment. So mild cognitive impairment is that sort of impairment where you start to see some cognitive signs, but activities of daily living are still very independent. This study showed that um, after 12 months and, and people in this study were put into either the aerobic exercise uh, arm or the, the stretching and balance arm. So they were either told to do the aerobic or they were told to do the strength and balance. And after 12 months, study participants with mild cognitive impairment in both groups showed no cognitive decline. Now, this is exciting for a couple of reasons. One is it shows that what we also know is that exercise should be a little bit more well-rounded, right? It shouldn't just be running on the treadmill all the time. But it also, when you think about older adults, the ability to be able to tailor uh, exercise could be very beneficial if someone has other medical um, issues. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just tell you a little bit about blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, you need to treat your blood pressure. This study, the Sprint Mind study showed, again, there were two arms in this trial, people that were kept at what was then considered normal blood pressure at 140 systolic versus the intensive treatment, which was lowering that blood pressure to 120 systolic, which no coincidence is now considered to be normal blood pressure. Those in the intensive treatment had a 19% reduced risk for mild cognitive impairment, a 17% reduced risk for dementia, and 15% when you looked at both together. They're going to expand that study a little bit more, look at those people a little bit longer so we can really clarify that impact. And this is all coming together. The Alzheimer's Association is really investing in understanding what helps us to reduce risks through something called the U.S. Pointer Study. We just finished up recruitment for this, so we have another two years before we'll get that data, but really exciting to see how we can put, give people the information about exercise, uh, diet, um, intellectual eng engagement, all of those health coaching, um, and give them the, the tools to kind of create their own plans um, and see whether or not it has an impact. And if this proves effective, it will lead the way in the development of an accessible and sustainable community-based program for prevention. All of this is helping us in thinking about the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. Um, we know that if we could develop a treatment by 2025 that could delay the onset by five years, look how many people by 2050 would not develop Alzheimer's. In the meantime, we are here to help. Our 24-hour helpline is available seven days a week, 365 days a year. We have educational programs like this, support groups, places for you to go and meet with other caregivers or people living with, the, with dementia, and all of our easy ways uh, to find us here. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over. I know I went a little over this time, but I'm going to stop sharing. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you, Claire. That was amazing. I, I learned more. We did a we've done other presentations with you every time that we we give these talks with you. I learned more. And what a wonderful message about one, the resources. So that 24-7 helpline, use it, find it. Um, uh, what an incredible, uh, what an incredible resource to everybody. So the Alzheimer's Association, that 24-7 helpline. I think it's the first stop, but they have amazing resources. And I also just love that there are so many interventions we can do for ourselves to reduce the, the odds that we could face dementia down the road. Exercise, reducing processed foods, eating that Mediterranean diet and lots of leafy greens, things that, that can help all of us. And for the record, I actually don't eat SpaghettiOs anymore. I gave them up a good. little while ago. That's good. Uh, I know I used to be terrified of salad and now 
Uh, I actually eat it a lot. I come to like it. And, and it's it feels so good when you're eating food that you know is good for you. That's like contributing to your long-term health. But I think the other point that you made that's really good is it's never too late. So, Absolutely. you know, we want to empower you with both the legal steps you need to take, but we want you to be healthy. We hope you don't need these legal tools for a long time. You know, we want to delay the need for legal and financial planning steps to be to kick in where you need that help. So, wow. Thank you so much, Claire. And we will take some questions at the end, um, but that was fantastic. And, and if every, anybody wants to you know, reach out to them, owls.org, uh, plenty of resources, and you can always connect to us and we can help connect you with the right people there. But I want to now transition because we are lawyers about, Claire talked about some of the resources, the lifestyle interventions, some of the new discoveries we're making around Alzheimer's and hopefully some of the new treatments. I'm hopeful that artificial intelligence will cure Alzheimer's before it destroys all of us. Um, you know, let's, let's hope. Uh, but I want to just spend a moment um, talking about some of the key legal steps that you need to take and really the updates you need to make. So here are just some of the, the issues we need to flag. Every adult who has any assets needs three core documents, revocable living trust, durable power of attorney, advanced health care directive. Revocable living trust, a much better version of a will, allows someone to step in and manage your major assets, your successor trustees. If you're incapacitated, make sure your assets go where you want them to go. If um, when you kick the bucket without being exposed to courts, Durable power of attorney for finance. That's a critical document, especially when you're facing dementia, because that's the document where you authorize the individual or individuals who you trust to step in and deal with your day-to-day -day legal and financial issues um, on your behalf to step into your shoes. And it has a lot of implications when you're facing dementia issues. Mike's going to talk in a moment about some of the government programs that are available to help pay for this, like Medicaid, Medi-Cal. But sometimes you need to empower someone to take the steps to make you eligible if you can no longer manage your finances for yourself. Um, advanced directive, healthcare decision making, crucial. And we always want to make the point you might have, you know, raise your hand virtually if you have these documents in place. I can't see you, but let's pretend that I could. OK, I see maybe a few of you. If you're a client of Gilfix in the poll, you probably have them. Um, if you're not, you might not. Um, but has it been more than three years since you updated or has, has there been a change in your life since you created those documents where maybe they're no longer the right people named or up to date? Um, or maybe you created those documents using sort of an online service or a very simple service. That's the case, you need to update them. You need to make sure these documents are updated. If they are old, well, one, they might not have the right legal language in them. And two, they can become stale where hospitals and financial and government institutions, they don't like to accept old documents. So if you're counting on the document you created 15 years ago that empowers you know, your sibling to step in for you, they might have a lot of issues. Uh, one, it may not be up to, it may not have the right language. And two, if it's old, you know, we're human. You see an old document, you don't trust it as much as a recent one. So it's always good to refresh your documents and you have to make sure they're up to date. That you have the right people named, that your assets are directed where you want them to go. Because if you have severe dementia or memory issues, you may lose the ability to update those documents down the road and you may lose the ability to change who's named in them and where your assets are going. We always want to make a point here. The first step when families come in to see us and they have a parent or grandparent, or maybe it's a person themselves who's facing a dementia diagnosis and they need to take steps, the first thing we want to look at is their durable power of attorney document. Because that's, again, that's the document that authorizes someone else to make key legal decisions and, and key updates to their estate plan, certain types of updates and asset transfers and long-term care planning on their behalf if they can't do it. And we don't want to see just a check the box form. How, have you, how many of you out there have a durable power of attorney where you have a check the box form? Leave a comment if, if that's the case or raise your hand or, or you can enter it here. If it's a check the box form, that's fine for basic steps, but it probably doesn't cover some of the critical asset protection tools that we need to have in these documents. So all of this to say, you, you want to have these documents in place, um, but you you need to make sure they're up to date. So it's not just having them, it's it's making sure they're up to date. So you need to get a fresh look. Of course, we can help you with this at gilfix.com, very easy to find us, but uh, just so, so important that you have these documents up to date, especially if you're facing dementia. The moment you're facing these issues, you're worried about it, update those documents. Um, and we can often update them a little bit later than you might think. You might, just because you have a, a diagnosis does not mean you cannot update your documents. Because um, if you don't, your family might be stuck in court and trying to deal with things and they might be very limited in what they can do. So I think um, on that note, let's go. Mike is going to now talk about some of 
the other issues that we have to be aware of, financial planning, long-term care planning, government benefits. So Mike, why don't you go through that? Right. Uh, so when when we face some of these issues, of course, you have to have these key documents in place. They have to say the right things. To a large extent, that's to empower you, you the family member, you the designated trustee, you the trusted individual, to implement a plan that makes sense. And that's not a simple statement. Everybody's different. Everybody's profile is different. Somebody has more income, somebody has more assets, money in retirement accounts, whatever it may be. So I first want to stress the fact that to do a good job, you really want to integrate your financial planning with your legal planning. It, it, if you know, Once you think about this, it's obvious, but most of us don't think about it. We don't want to do some investment over here that makes long-term sense, perhaps, for somebody who's healthy, while on the legal planning side, we're planning because there's a diagnosis of dementia. We have to integrate the two and coordinate the two. Many reasons. One of them is eligibility for government benefits. There are a number of programs, Medi-Cal, California's version of the federal Medicaid program being the most significant. Uh, as many know, it is a program that can pay the cost of nursing home care, not assisted living, not board and care, but nursing home care. And that can save assets for a family. It can be the key to avoiding depression, all of the downsides of having assets exhausted. So we're always looking at what's a plan that makes sense? How are you going to get quality care? How are you going to pay for that care? How do you protect assets if it makes sense? But again, always the focus is on maximizing quality of life. And that's a complicated question. Most folks would rather preserve some assets for the next generation than have everything exhausted. Not everybody, but you know, it's a matter of identifying options, knowing the alternatives, knowing what steps can be taken. That's implementing a plan. There are myriad tax issues that come up. Uh, we've been very um, disappointed to see a lot of folks do kind of doing it at home. They learn some of the basics about Medi-Cal and they take steps. Ooh, they forgot about property tax increases. They forgot about capital gains because they're going to sell an asset. So again, when we do this kind of planning, it isn't just Medi-Cal. It isn't just a power of attorney. It's how do these things all fit together? What's the goal? How do we avoid making any tax mistakes, capturing benefits in the world of government benefits, maximizing all the good, accommodating all the bad, and just putting together a plan that makes a great deal of sense. It takes experience to understand how all these things come together. Now, I, I honestly believe it took me 15, 20 years to really develop an understanding of how these things fit together. Because again, you can understand, oh, get Medi-Cal, but what does it mean to have Medi-Cal? Where does it limit you? How does it empower you? Knowing where it's good and where it's not so good, that's part of the planning process. So it's complicated. We have to look at investments. We have to coordinate. We have to take sometimes radical steps, sometimes simple steps. Last point is that the Medi-Cal rules are constantly evolving and changing. Uh, the most material significant change is really kind of amazing in, in our view. It has been the case until recently that if an individual is in a nursing home, for example, she couldn't have more than $2,000 in countable assets while qualifying for Medi-Cal. Now, many, many assets don't count. In California, a home of any value doesn't count. Money in retirement, uh, retirement accounts, that doesn't count. By the way, you know that could be three, five, six million dollars worth of assets. They don't mm -hmm. count, okay? So it's been $2,000 in countable assets. That's been the plateau. That changed recently. Now it's $130,000, $130,000. If you're married, the spouse at home can have about $145,000 while still achieving eligibility for Medi-Cal. That's going to change in the future. We know what the changes are, but we're waiting to see what the details are going to be. So again, the point is, it's not static. You have to keep an eye on these things. We are training other attorneys. Uh, Mark and I co-authored a book on long-term care called Facing the Reality of Long-Term Care. Uh, we've made many copies available to the association and uh, it's available on Amazon through our office. It's free to our clients. It uh, is a little bit out of date on that one point that I mentioned, that $2,000 factor. But when it comes to planning and all the issues you need to think about, it's up to date. So we continue to watch everything to be available, to know how to put all of these pieces together, which I think is the most important point. Yeah, I'm just looking to see if I had a copy of it in my office. I should. I could have held it up, but that's but we don't have it here. But I think it's available on Amazon. Facing the reality of long-term <laughs> care. 
I've got copies. I just we just moved offices and I unpacked them, so I know exactly where they are. Uh, amazing, good. amazing. So you can get it through. You can see a copy at the Alzheimer's Association if you're a client. <laughs> It's available to you. And I think it is available on Amazon. You can also contact our office to get a copy. But I know Mike talked about how we need to deal with tax issues and, and government benefits, eligibility issues, you know, property tax, capital gains tax, income tax, estate tax. Yeah, it is complicated, but we don't want to just overwhelm you. We can absolutely help. You have resources available. So I just want to define some action steps. It really, quite simply, Talk to us. I, I know that this is what we do. You need to work with experts to sort through this. Um, there are many, many clients who have come to me in the last few years. And Mike, you've, you've worked with, I mean, hundreds of families in the situation. And there's no one size fits all situation. But we can walk you through it step by step. And we can make sure your plan is updated properly. Because if, if it isn't updated, it hasn't been updated for a while, this might be our last chance. You might lose the opportunity to update it forever if you don't come in and get that done. And we can walk you through those issues. Maybe some of the issues Mike flagged are not problematic. Maybe they really are. Um, so the key is we absolutely can help. But get that get that help and, and talk to the Alzheimer's Association. You know, Claire and her team are amazing. That 24-7 helpline available at alzalz.org. Another wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, and I want to just emphasize this. Just Take a moment, overcome the three Ds, I like to call it the danger of delay and denial. You think I'll get to it forever. I'll get to it later. I'll, I'm never going to have dementia or my parents aren't or my grandparents aren't um, or I already did documents. I'm done. I don't need to talk to lawyers. Avoiding these steps now will lead to massive problems later. We are on the other side of that, helping families that didn't plan ahead, but we're also helping a lot of families who have. And I just want you to take a moment to imagine the future and imagine a future where you've taken these steps. And we don't want anybody to, to face the issues of dementia. We hope you never have to face them. Many of you probably are, already are. But just think of all we can do ahead of time to hopefully slow down the progression of dementia by taking the right steps for diet and by taking the, the right steps to live a healthy lifestyle and building that team. So when you need that help, it's there. When you have those documents and that financial plan in place, rather than being a catastrophe, it's something that you and your family can deal with. So imagine if you take those steps and what the impact it can have. And if you want to work with us, very easy to find us. Um, we're going to take questions in just a second. Easy to, to find us. We're at guiltfix.com. You can easily set a, a planning meeting with us if you'd like to discuss this. Call us 650-493-8070. I think we have a different number on our website that also works. Guildfix.com. And subscribe to our YouTube channel if you found this helpful and can share. I want to share this with someone in your family who needs to, to hear this. We want to spread the word. We want people to be empowered. And knowledge is power. And there's so much ignorance and fear around the issues of dementia. So easy to contact us. Uh, leave a comment. If you're watching this as a recording, you know, leave us your question. What, what can we be helpful with? Uh, let us know. We want to be a service. So follow us, you know, subscribe to our YouTube Guild Fix Law YouTube channel for more educational content. We're going to do more talks with Claire and her team in coming months. So stay tuned for that. But that was a lot. Let's take just a, a couple of questions. And I have one actually, Claire. So I, I, I hit on this a little bit, but when you talk about diet, we, we know it's avoiding processed foods. But what is the, the best, most recent thinking about what the right diet is? Yeah, the the most of the research around dementia certainly looks at something called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. Um, and it's a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, all that have been sort of researched to find the best uh, best cognitive um, health. And so that's things like dark green leafy vegetables, like you mentioned, plenty of salads, um, uh, the fishes that are your omega-3 fatty acids, so salmon, um, mackerel, tuna, um, uh, lean proteins. Uh, and then it's really about balance, right? It's about limiting the stuff that you um, shouldn't overindulge in. It's not necessarily about cutting it all out. It's just about making sure that it's um, it's in moderation and not sort of the majority of what you're eating. Um, what I like about the, um, the MIND diet too is that it gives um, sort of concrete um, steps on like a target for, for where you should really based on points. So you can have a, a good day one day and, uh, and, and sort of, you know, kind of balance out that, um, 
you know, that chocolate ice cream that you want to have tomorrow. Um, but really it's about, um, th- it's been, it's the diet we're using in the uh, U.S. pointer study, but it's also been studied and there's a, a, a lot of research to back it up. Amazing. Uh, oh, Mike, you're, uh, you're muted. We'll, we'll unmute you in a second. There you go. Oh, wait, always an adventure with Zoom. There we go. There so, go. so a question, um, the, this is a, a child of somebody they're concerned about that uh, doctor has already indicated that my dad suffers from dementia and uh, communist, I, I thought it was too late therefore for him to do any planning. You know, n- not so at all. Uh, dementia is kind of in stages. A person in the most advanced stage indeed really doesn't have capacity, can't sign anything. But in the early stage, you may suffer from some elements of dementia, but that does not mean that you lack capacity, that you lack the ability to understand and sign basic legal documents. So it is rarely, rarely too late. So keep that yeah. in mind, be proactive, take the steps that we've identified. Yeah, it's, it's rarely too late, both from a, a legal planning perspective and a, and a lifestyle perspective. Uh, but and, and for those of us who are a little bit younger and worried about this for our parents and grandparents, well, hey, let's, let's start <laughs> changing our lifestyles a little bit to make sure that we give ourselves the best odds of avoiding it, right? Because we have all this knowledge now. And yeah, I, as I said earlier, I hope, we hope that, that artificial intelligence finds a cure for this before it destroys us. Um, but I, we can't I, I rely think, on that. I, th- I think Mark is going to take away my beer and start force feeding me salad. My future. I kind of already do, right? We order <laughs> we order a plug. I don't get paid by that, but we love sweet green. We order sweet green for, <laughs> for lunch all the time in the office. We used to get Togo sandwiches and, and you know heavy foods, and we've kind of moved away from that. And That's I feel over. so much better. I have so much more energy. So um, a, a plug yeah, for a company just, that does not pay me. It's it's just worth. It's also worth noting. Like I, I do want to just acknowledge. We know that that's not the answer. Right? It's not going to be the only thing. And and we certainly know plenty of people that have lived healthy lifestyles and still have developed Alzheimer's Absolutely. disease. I always like to say that because I don't want people to be like, well, I did all those things and I'm still in. This. You know, there's just so much about the brain mm-hmm. we don't know, but we also yeah. know that. It's it's not just good for your brain; it's good for your cardiovascular health. And so, it just wanted to make, mention that. Sure, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not like if, if it happens to someone you love, it's not most likely not their fault, right? It's but right. but let's do everything we can. But what we can so what we like to say a lot: there's so much in life that we cannot control. There's war in mm-hmm. Russia in the Ukraine. There's inflation that's out of control. There's changes happening in society at a rate that that we've never seen, and it feels very scary. And it feels like there's so much we can't control. Dementia is just another issue in our families. Let's focus on what we can control. Let's let's understand the resources that are available, and let's imagine that future where we we take those steps to build that expert team of resources, and we reach out to the Alzheimer's Association, and we build that legal and financial team, and we can absolutely be a part of that. Everybody here, uh, we, we want to be able to serve you. So build that team, get those documents updated. Don't put your head in the sand. Don't just wait for disaster to happen. And it may not be too late, even if it is already kind of tough. But we know what you know, many of you watching this are probably dealing with this now. We, we've been through it ourselves, but every situation is different. Every situation is just so challenging. So my heart goes out to all those caregivers out there who are putting in the time to support someone with dementia. And let's make sure that we have all the tools in place to protect those assets we work so hard for. Make sure that person gets the best possible care. So make sure your legal documents are up to date, that you have that legal financial team in place, that you reach out to the Alzheimer's Association, alz.org, and that 24-7 helpline. Can you just give the 24-7 helpline number, Claire, before we wrap things up? 800-272-3900. And easy to find online as well. So maybe we'll put it in notes for this webinar. So if you have any comments or questions, leave them in the the comments below if you're watching the recording of this. But we we thank you so, so much, Claire, for joining us here today. We're going to have more talks with you. We look forward to that. And for those of you watching, um, you know, follow our Guild Fix Law YouTube channel for more content like this. We want to empower and educate you. Uh, We love to get the chance to serve you. So I hope everybody's staying safe, sane, and healthy. Gabe, thank you so much for giving us part of your day. um, And we really appreciate it. We don't take it for granted. So be well, everybody. Good night, all. Take care. Thanks, everybody.